Julie Bishop, Australia's Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, thank you for your time today. Delighted. I'd like to start, if I can, by asking you to cast your mind back to the 5th of June last year. Uh, it was the morning that most people around the country woke up to Prime Minister Rudd's ambitious plan for an Asia-Pacific community. Um, now, at the time, I realised you weren't in your current portfolio, but can you give us some sort of indication as to what your and your colleagues' initial reactions were and sort of take us in the room, so to speak? It was apparent that it was a very hasty decision because there was absolutely no detail surrounding the proposal. It was clearly designed to be an announcement for Mr Rudd to make as he was going overseas. And yet there was very little detail, it was very vague. It began as a proposal as a European Union style community for the Asia Pacific. And we had deep concerns about the proposal at the time and those concerns continue to this day. Sure, but aside from sort of the, the politics of it, would it be fair to say at least that on the substance of the question of discussing the, the region and the strategic and economic future of its institutions, that, that that itself has merit? The proposal was done without any consultation with nations in the Asia Pacific. And in that regard, uh, no wonder it has received such a lukewarm response. It appeared as if it were Australia uh, saying that there is a problem in the Asia-Pacific but not identifying the problem with the architecture and then saying Australia will fix it. Now, I don't think that was a very diplomatic way to go about starting a consultation process over the regional architecture. In fact, um, in my experience, um, in my legal career, when an Australian law firm was trying to create a network of law firms in the Asia-Pacific, the best way to do it is to ask the countries in the Asia-Pacific, whether they thought there was a problem that needed addressing and then come up with the proposal. Mr Rudd did it the other way around. He said there is a problem without identifying it and he said I will fix it without consulting. That can be seen as arrogant and rude. Right. And, and sort of on that question of the European Union, I mean the Prime Minister has sort of since clarified that he has no prescriptive view, uh, his words, on the outcome of the idea, including also that he's not looking for a common currency. Um, how would a prospective Turnbull government sort of see the future of the Asia-Pacific institutions then, and would it have any prescriptive view of them? Well, it's interesting that you say the Prime Minister has now walked away from the European Union style, uh, but he hasn't come up with any definition of what he's actually looking for. Um, he's seeking to replace the existing architecture. Now, I'm not suggesting that the regional architecture is perfect, but there are a number of fora that do serve specific regional purposes. Um, ASEAN Plus Three, the East Asia Summit, APEC, all have specific purposes. Mr Rudd has not made it clear whether he intends to replace all of those organisations with one Asia-Pacific community. If that is his intention, then it raises a good many questions about how that would ever be achieved. I think it's a pipe dream and I doubt very much that Mr Rudd would be able to design the perfect structure for the Asia-Pacific. I think that one of the most overlooked achievements of the Howard government is our entry into the East Asia Summit in 2005. That was a significant achievement for the Howard government, yet it gets little recognition today. For Australia to become part of that organisation was a milestone. And I would be interested in looking at an expansion of the East Asia Summit, possibly by the inclusion of the United States. And I think that the East Asia Summit plus the United States, together with ASEAN plus three and APEC for different purposes, would be an improvement on the current regional architecture. Mm, indeed, on the East Asia Summit, obviously the Prime Minister's just got back from Thailand from that, uh, where he in fact briefed regional leaders on his idea with Dick Walcott, his, his special envoy. Um, but the new Japanese Prime Minister there, only in the job one month, suggested something very similar in terms of the expansion of ASEAN um, but that it would not include the United States. So what's your reaction to the sort of concept of an expanded ASEAN without the United States present? Well, I think the East Asia Summit with the United States would meet the concerns that Mr Rudd had. So instead of throwing out all of the architecture, as it seems he wishes to do, and replace it with a one-size-fits-all Asia-Pacific community, I would be working with the countries in the region to see if we could improve upon the existing architecture. Now, if you look at Mr Rudd's proposal, proposal an Asia-Pacific community, well, let's start with the practical consequences of that. What does he define as the Asia-Pacific community? If 
Australia is to be included, that must also include all the Pacific states. If all the Pacific states are included, that must include the countries with a border on the Pacific, the United States, then you get to Latin America, South America, are they to be included? If you look on the other side of um, Asia, is Taiwan to be included? Is Burma to be included? If you have India in it, why not Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq? Mm -hmm. So I think that it fails at the first hurdle. He hasn't defined what is the Asian Pacific community and he hasn't given any idea of the um, purpose or the focus of this Asia Pacific community. Mm. On the Wolcott consultations, he obviously went to the, the 21 APEC member countries and that's in some ways perhaps what, what the Prime Minister is defining as the Asia Pacific. Um, the Wolcott report um, concluded that there was widespread, widespread support for the conversation but little appetite for the institutions as it seems to be uh, what you're articulating today. Could you, uh, could you contrast that perhaps with also what you're hearing from, from government officials around the region as either you're travelling or speaking to them and again sort of take us in the room as to what some of those reactions are? Uh, Dick Wolcott is a senior diplomat, uh, retired but a man who is respected in the region. I would expect people to be polite and listen to what he had to say. It would be extraordinary if they did not. Mm. But that doesn't mean that polite listening equates to support or even acknowledgement that it's a good idea. And I know that a number of countries are concerned about the idea, first because of the way in which it was presented to them, and that did more than ruffle fe feathers. Um, it's not so much the idea, mm. but the manner in which it was presented. Um, also, what is Australia trying to achieve? What's actually underlying the agenda? So people are rather suspicious. And that comes about because of the lack of detail. It's very vague in um, content, in direction, and that concerns people. And then also, there are a number of countries who have a deep interest in a particular organisation, um, Singapore in APEC, for example, um, or Japan in the East Asia Summit, for example. So. Some countries are concerned that their interests, which are being well served by a particular organisation, would be subsumed by this um, all-purpose, one-size-fits-all Asia-Pacific community. The feedback I'm getting is um, how interesting, but they have no real appetite for it at all. And I also think that there's a, a, a concern that um, the Prime Minister hasn't been upfront about what he's actually trying to achieve. And on that basis, people are suspicious of it. Could we, could we perhaps just drill a little bit deeper? Could you sort of take us in the room at what sort of level in, in these governments are you hearing this? Maybe not which p particular government or country, but, but at what sort of level you're hearing this from? At the level in which I operate, I'm hearing it from um, various people at various levels, uh, but they're also making these statements public. So I don't have to breach any confidences or put any diplomats or um, government members in difficult positions. These positions are being made public. And I think the enthusiasm um, with which the Japanese proposal was received in Thailand recently indicates that they are certainly not wedded to Mr Rudd's proposal and in fact are looking at an expansion or a modification, if you like, of the existing architecture. And it's also been put to me on a number of occasions that uh, the nations actually prefer to be able to have organisations or fora or um, summits that meet different circumstances for um, different times. And you might have some nations in a grouping for one purpose, but you might expand it or uh, make it smaller for another purpose. And that kind of flexibility suits the region. I think it's a mistake to try and lump the Asia Pacific as um, one amorphous mass. They are very individual countries, very individual backgrounds, culture, history, social, legal, um, political, perspectives and to suggest that they could all be put into one European Union style community I think is an insult to them. Mm. Um, going forward the Prime Minister has now announced a conference in December in Sydney to, to discuss the, the concept further. Um, just quickly firstly will you and the opposition be participating in that at all? Have you been invited? To I that? have not been invited. No. Do you expect to be invited? To that? Oh that's a matter you have to put to Mr Rudd. I haven't received an invitation I don't believe um, my leader Malcolm Turnbull has either. Right, and uh, and finally, what do you what do you expect the outcome of his briefings to regional leaders at APEC and also at that conference to to actually yield? Where do you expect this to go? I sort of expect that over the next year, a lot of the focus will be on domestic issues ahead of the uh, election. Well, it depends very much 
what Mr Rudd defines as the proposal. It's already moved some way from the thought bubble of June last year to something quite different. And now that there is a competing proposal, if you like, from Japan, um, I'm sure that it will change even further. But uh, I don't expect there to be um, anything other than a general discussion at this meeting. I'm not sure who's been invited. Uh, that will be interesting in itself. If it's going to be the 21 um, APEC countries, well then the question is why would they be seeking to set up another APEC? If it's not the 21 APEC countries and people are excluded or included, well I think that it's uh, starting off on the wrong foot. It's already determining membership, so I think it'll be a very interesting invitation list. Great. Thank you very much, Julie Bishop. My pleasure.